Hello, friends. We welcome you here to worship this day, and this is indeed a wonderful worship service, as they all are. But today, we acknowledge World Communion Sunday. So that means that we are gathering at God's table with our brothers and sisters in Christ from all over the world, and we are going to celebrate the sacrament of communion. I believe this year, this World Communion Sunday in particular, has so much more meaning now that we are still all experiencing together this global pandemic. And unlike any other time in any of our lives, we are now more connected than ever. So we give thanks to God for his goodness this day and all days. And also here in this particular community of faith, we are continuing to journey through our stewardship season where we look at the theme of RGPC Cares, Encountering Christ for a Better Tomorrow. Because it is our understanding that it is Jesus Christ who is the one who will continue to lead us and guide us, and he will be our sure hope and our sure strength today and tomorrow. So this morning, or today, or whenever you are watching this worship service, we have a very special guest, Mrs. Adams. And for all of our kids out there, she is going to teach you something super quick. Okay, so today for our response, you are going to say these words with me, and we're going to sign them together. We're going to say, His faithful love will last forever. Should we try it one more time? Yes. Okay. His faithful love will last forever. All right, ready? So here you go, guys. Ready? The Lord is good. Give thanks. No, let's start over. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love will last forever. And now let us worship God. We open the window of our sacred hearts, connecting us one to another. We open the window on our community, ready to be set free to love and live for justice. We open the window on our world and recognize the spirit of God in all creation. We open the window on our church, following Jesus by loving our neighbors. Let, Let us worship, worship God. God. Let's sing him 530, one bread, one body.
Our God is nearer to us than we know, closer to us than we feel, and more merciful to us than we can imagine. In prayer, let us now ask for the forgiveness that God has promised. Let us pray. Holy God, we were intended to bear the nature of Jesus to speak and act the way he speaks and acts, to love as he loves, to forgive as he forgives, to value what he values. We know we are in need of your love and grace. Gracious God, forgive us for not loving our neighbors as ourselves and choosing selfishness over selflessness. Forgive us when we chose to act in ways that are uncharacteristic of your son, Jesus. Help us, we pray, to keep turning toward you while turning away from all that keeps us from living into our identities of being your beloved children. Amen. To all who confess their failures and resolve to lead a new life, Jesus says, you are forgiven. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our 2021 stewardship Bible verse is found in the New Testament letters of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So you all just heard Dr. Bob read for you the passage from Ephesians, which happens to be the scripture that we have chosen for this year's stewardship campaign. And so we decided we wanted to bring you all down here to Fellowship Hall, to this place where on Sunday mornings it's alive with chatter, with tables full of all of you enjoying one another's fellowship and company and, and good coffee, of course. Just imagine you can, you can hear the kids running around and you can hear their, their voices and um, hear them playing with one another and... Uh, the table is always pretty a pretty magical place. Lots of things happen at the table. It's a, it's a place where relationships are formed and um, strengthened. Uh, it's, it's a special place in everyone's home. It's a place where families gather. 
And we also know that uh, throughout Jesus' life and through his ministry, the table was incredibly important. As today is World Communion Sunday, of course, there's no more important table than the table of Christ in which we all have been invited to. But we know that Jesus spent lots of time at meal with people at tables, and he used that opportunity to teach and uh, to share his parables and to share his messages of love and the way in which we all should be living our lives. And how grateful are we that we still have those, those stories of the things that he taught and the things that he said. And I am so grateful that this community has chosen to follow him as best we can, and especially to use his example of care, which is our big theme for this year's stewardship. RGPC cares. Also, one of the ways that we were thinking as a stewardship committee when we were looking at this year is looking at ministries of care. We wanted to make sure that we keep focusing on the why behind why we do the things that we do. And that's so important. And that's where that tagline of encountering Christ for a better tomorrow came in. So I read this morning in my devotion uh, during my, my scripture reading time this morning, um, and it was one of those one of those things often it often happens with me that when I'm reading scripture, things jump out in a different way that they hadn't before. And this uh, reading for me this morning was part of uh, Jesus's encounter with his disciples during the Last Supper. And the the disciples were having a bit of an argument with one another. They were trying to decide who among them mm-hmm. should be the greatest. And of course, Jesus takes that opportunity to, uh, to gently remind them. Um, and, and he asked them a question that typically, who is the greatest? Is it not the person sitting at the table? To which they said, yes, it is usually the person sitting at the table would be considered the greatest because that is the person who is being waited on. That is the person who is being served. And Jesus looks at them and he says, well, am I not sitting at the table? but I am also here as a servant. So it was just his way of saying he was the greatest, but as being the greatest, he was a servant first and foremost. And I just love that imagery. And especially as today when we were thinking about this message and thinking about this worship service and how important the table is that that even Jesus comes to sit at the table with us, not only as the greatest entity the world has ever known, but also the greatest servant the world has ever known. So true, so true. Encountering Christ for a better tomorrow is the essence of this campaign. We meet Christ in our neighbor here in the pew, and then we take Christ out our doors. For our caring ministries, so often during Stephen minister training, deacons training, Uh, I will get asked the question, well, what do we say when we show up at a door or we're in this particular situation? And uh, what I tend to say is sometimes it's not about the words. It's about showing up because when you show up, God shows up. So I have been to more events, services, fellowship opportunities around these tables, and I can honestly say I have seen Christ in you Mm -hmm. around these tables, and I have encountered Christ in this congregation, in our church family. So encountering Christ for a better tomorrow really makes all the why behind the stewardship campaign. And so as we begin to think about that in our servant leadership, we begin to look at the caring ministries of this congregation And you'll notice that the logo, RGPC Cares, has a heart with a mask over it. Justin Bennett was the genius behind (laughs) that logo. Thank you, Justin. And that is to remind us that during COVID, our caring ministries continued. We were asked to, by the mayor, to uh, put together some blessing bags for the nursing staff at St. Mary's, whose ears were just getting sore already only the second month Mm -hmm. in. And so their goal was 500 bags, and as Rosedale Gardens Presbyterian Church does, they doubled it. (laughs) We dropped off 1,000 bags, and even a few more trickled in. We were also able last month to go out to our Livonia Police Department. Our officers, our fire department have been working 24-7, and we were able to drop off a meal. 
and it covered all three shifts. That was a lot of food, and before we could barely get it in the roll call room, there was a line of 15 officers <laughs> lined up in the hallway ready to eat it. They were hungry. <laughs> they were really <laughs> hungry. You know, um, the list of things that this community does and the ways in which this community cares is really, really long. And um, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to do it justice, but we'd like to just point out a few, few of the caring ministries within this congregation. Everything from the deacons and all the things that they do for starters. Stephen Ministry, uh, support group for caregivers, which is a pretty new group that started up last year. A group of people came together and uh, said they really wanted to help and take care of one another, those who were caring for others, um, either in a job or in their own home. Uh, we, of course, have our Wednesday prayer circle, and every single one of us has always been in need of prayer, and it's so great to know that there's this amazing group of people that get together every Wednesday and pray for each one of you and you're prayed for whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. um, we've also been so blessed that we have a director of congregational care position in this, uh, at this church, and that is actually really rare. So how blessed are we that we have that? Um, of course, the children's ministry headed up by Mrs. Adams, the, those kids are always doing stuff to care for Mm -hmm. uh, people not only outside the congregation but within the congregation and more than likely you have been a recipient of something that they have done for you they have done stuff for our our vips they have done stuff for teachers uh it's it's just been amazing and she is uh raising them up right so to speak <laughs> in the in the way of christ uh, we have a food and gas card ministry where we have a number of people every month that are recipients of food and gas cards, those who have great need for one or the other. We've been so blessed that we have Rosie the Bus that uh, may, not, may not on the outset look like a care ministry, but the fact that there are people that wouldn't have been able to come to worship had we not had a bus like that that could, that could bring them here. That's a huge part of our caring ministry. Uh, Sandy Main Namisto and her her bench buddies and the way in which she she just ministers mm -hmm. to the kids and when she came up with that idea to have children come and sit with her during worship and just to watch her play is such an amazing thing and and of course anytime you're in Sandy's presence you are being cared for mm -hmm. and it was a great way to get the the kids not only involved in in worship but just to really get a sense for all that is put into the music ministry and and of course not only kids sit at the bench with sandy but <laughs> adults started getting into it too and i'm pretty sure pinky Folsom was one of the first that got to join her on the bench on sunday morning and even to this day and if you watch closely in in this worship service you will see that sandy has a picture of her and pinky mm -hmm. posted right there mm -hmm. on uh on her um, Oregon bench, mm -hmm. and it's a picture of when Pinky was her bench buddy. And, and of course, this congregation, we are so, um, one of the biggest things that we identify as is a military and first responder and their families caring congregation. And we, um, to, the, to the depths of our being, really identify with that and there are a variety of ways in which we care for all those folks uh, not only within the congregation but outside the congregation and through that ministry last december um, thanks to sergeant major dave laycock a group of us went out to the great lakes national cemetery for their wreaths across america day mm -hmm. where we had just the the privilege of mm -hmm. laying a wreath at the headstone of all those soldiers who were who were buried there and then, of course, out of that ministry, there came another ministry called The Sewing Circle. And this group of incredibly talented women have made some beautiful quilts for ver a variety of people over the years. Um, but it started being made for ve uh, veterans and families of veterans that were uh, presented during our Veterans mm -hmm. Day service as well as our Memorial Day service and they have just done amazing work. And not only do they do those quilts, 
but they also make uh, clothes for preemies that are in the NICU. And if it wasn't for our sewing circle, they did a, a, an incredible job of sewing so many masks for all of the blessing bags that went to St. Mary's. And they have also sewn a bunch of masks that mm -hmm. are here at the church for when you all come back to worship. And if you forgot your mask, you can have a beautiful handmade mask from these amazing women. Mm -hmm. Now, I just barely touched on the things that this congregation does to care for, for one another. And I would also invite you to maybe go check out our website where you're gonna see even more detail because we could easily talk forever about mm -hmm. all the things that this congregation does for other people. But that was just a quick snapshot to show you all the things that um, your money has done for us in the past, that mm -hmm. pledges and, and um, just, just our general budget has been able to take care of all the ways in which we have just cared for one another. And mm -hmm. we're so grateful for all that we've been able to do through your financial support. Mm -hmm. But now as we look to 2021, I would encourage you to look at your pledge and start dreaming. Dream about what God can do with that money. That's just an example of stuff that we've done in the past. Just imagine what we can do mm. in the future. And I know the two of us truly believe that when money is placed into God's hands, he does stuff with it in greater ways than we can ever imagine. Amen. You know, one of the things too is that the congregation ministers to its pastors. I've been the recipient of Sunday suppers, um, been able to participate with all of you in countless events and mission projects and caring service. And that's part of who we are. We say that... Uh, and it's even printed on the bus that we practice welcoming relationships and caring service to the glory of Jesus Christ. So we are a congregation that says what we mean and means what we say, and we live that out. Also, I, I wanted to say too that when this all happened on that fateful day of March 13th, after we got over the shock of closing the doors of the church, Instantly, we started calling people, and from that moment on, it kind of helped us go from what do we do now to how do we reach all of you? And it was through these incredible volunteers, church members who joined the calling team, the card team a month later, continuing to find ways to reach out to us all. Again, another example of what it means to be at Rosedale Gardens Presbyterian Church. I think, too, the whole piece about having a better tomorrow, a little bit like endowment, looking forward to the future. Imagine all those who came before us who thought of this church before it was even built. And then it was built from the ground up and it's been expanded upon through the years. Now we look to the future with hope. And it's really bold to say that in the midst of a global pandemic. <laughs> we can say that because by the grace of Jesus Christ, and through him, we are continuing to be a vital, thriving church family that continues to take care of one another, continues to take care of others outside our doors. So part of stewardship, you've heard them, you know, the, the, the three T's, um, time, tithing, and um, also good work, sharing your abilities and talents. And you can't just have one of those things. It's not enough just to have the money or just to have the time or just to have us all sharing. It's all of it together that makes ministry happen. And so I would encourage you as you begin to think about your pledge, I know you have your, <laughs> your letter from yours truly and the stewardship committee and you have your pledge card before you. I'd like to think about that when I fill out mine every year, I think that the financial contributions are really the wheels on the bus, so to speak, of the ministry of this congregation. And it's hard to put a price tag on the changed lives that have come through our doors. You know, there's nothing like having an opportunity, maybe even if it's a hardship in your life, and you walk into a place on Sunday morning and people know your name and they sit with you and you can put your name on the prayer list and you know that you're being cared for and loved. And that helps kind of transform someone from the inside out. So we're all about changing lives, and by God's grace, we're going to continue to do that. And with that, I want to say thank you. 
on behalf of the pastoral team and the staff, on behalf of the stewardship committee, you are incredibly generous. And because you are, we are able to do incredible things, not only with folks inside our congregation, but for those outside. So on behalf of us all here at Rosedale, thank you so much for continuing to follow Jesus Christ. We are all partners in that ministry. God bless you on the second Sunday in Stewardship. Our second Bible reading is from the New Testament Book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Listen closely for the word of God for you today. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to have you in the church today. I love this little corner at the bottom of the stairs by the Fairfield entrance because once upon a time, a VBS was happening, and I came running down the stairs, and there was a whole class of little ones with a teacher with her Bible open. I don't know what the lesson was, but I do remember that they were talking about the early church and made me think of how much we need one another and how the church was built on the foundation of Jesus Christ and those first disciples. So I'm going to take you to the early church today, and I want you to imagine, like I am today, that you're one of those early believers, and you're worshiping in someone's home and we have the scriptures in front of us, and the message of Jesus still rings in our ears. Now there was a whole group of those who believed they were of one heart and one soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses or sold them and bought the proceeds of what was sold, the, they laid at the disciples' feet, and there was distributed to each and any has had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Encountering Christ for a better tomorrow has to start with those early days of the church. It's why we have churches today. And look where it all started, not actually in a church building, much like all of us worshiping at home. That's where worship started in the days of the early church so Christians could identify where worship would happen. They would take a stick and in the sand they would draw the image of a fish, the symbol for Christ, and it would point the direction where they could go and worship together. So how important was it that this early church of which we are a part communed together, not just broke bread and drank wine or juice, but were together. And look at how they defined themselves. They were of one heart and one mind and one soul. And all that they owned, they collected together. And what an amazing gift it was that now they are one. 
They bring all their resources, all their gifts and talents that they have individually, and they bring it to the collective church, the church with no building. The church truly is, the church truly was, the people, the body of Christ in the world. And it says that they still talked about and lived for Jesus, who they had now seen rise from the dead, who promised eternal life. And in the midst of those days when they were hiding in fear of being persecuted, they still worshiped. They still saw the importance of their community. They still broke bread and, and concentrated on being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you know what was amazing? They didn't have much material wealth at all. And they didn't give out of their abundance. They gave out of their scarcity that no one would be found in need. What an amazing thing for us. You know, this character that they talk about, his name was Joseph, and then they gave him a new name, Barnabas. It was said that he had a really nice piece of real estate, and what he did is he brought it as gift to the church. And what you may not know about him is after that point, he really didn't need that land because he was about to join up with another sinner turned believer, a guy named Saul, who became Paul. And he would go out with Paul on his first missionary journey. So from that early church, great things were happening as they followed Jesus. Great things that lead us to church today. So now we've made our way through the church and we're in our church library. And this is the place where we teach our new members classes. It's the place where we have our Stephen ministers come for supervision as they care for others. It's the place where Bible study happens, where community is built. In this place, so much happens in the care ministry of the life of this church and in learning scripture and how faith meets real life. My favorite memories of this room tend to happen during new members classes. So new members come for the first day and they make their way to the library and when they enter, there's uh, wonderful people from our membership committee and they welcome them and they greet them and they give them a name tag and they put their name on their chest and then they are given Sharpies and there's newsprint all around this room. And they're asked, what brought you to Rosedale? What can the members and ministers expect of you? And what do you expect of the ministers and the members? It's an amazing time of conversation where our membership committee gets to hear firsthand the stories of those who are joining the church. And in this room, we teach a little bit about theology and about church government and history. Because remember, on World Communion Sunday, we are reminded that we are joined with brothers and sisters who came before us, who are with us now and who will come after us. And so in this room, I like to tell the new members a parable, and it's an old one. It's called the parable of heaven and hell. And this is how it goes. In hell, there's a beautiful table like this one, and it's heaped with beautiful food. It's so scrumptious and delicious. You can smell it from a mile away. And there's all these people around this table, but they're angry and they're upset and they're hungry because they have this disease where they can't bend at the elbows. And so they're starving, even though there's all this wonderful food to partake. And then we go to heaven. In heaven, it's the same table. It's filled to the brim with beautiful food to eat, hospitality all over the place but they are eating despite having the same disease. They too cannot bend their arms at the elbow. The difference is in heaven. They've learned to feed each other. That's what the church is all about. We learn to feed each other. And that history of feeding each other goes back to that early church. And it's gonna go well beyond us into the future. Those confirmands that sit in this room that learn about what it means to be church, well, they are the church, the church now and in the present, and the generations that will come after us, the 92 years of Rosedale Gardens that's brought us to this year, and we know that God will lead us still, 
And how will we go? We'll go together. True community in communion with each other, learning to feed each other through any kind of hardship. We know that we are there to be with one another. And in order to feed one another, we have to get close to one another. And that's what makes church more vibrant. It's those relationships that we have with one another. So how incredible is it to think of Jesus and all the people that he sat at table with through the New Testament, all the lives that were changed because of him. People encountered Jesus and they were changed for the better. They found a community bigger than themselves with a bold vision to go out into the world. So today we remember that in this church, at this time, in this pandemic, we are still called to feed one another. Welcome to the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from north and south and east and west. And so begins the start of every communion service, the great invitation to the table, not issued by the preacher or the pastor or the elders and deacons who serve, but by Jesus himself. For even though this table happens to be in the Rosedale Gardens Presbyterian Church, we proclaim the truth that we don't have ownership over this table. This table belongs to Jesus, just like the first table that he sat at on the night of the Last Supper with his disciples. You know, it's amazing how much attention is given in the four Gospels to just how much Jesus eats and makes house visits. It's really quite amazing. They seem to just be in wonder that the Son of God, the Messiah, was not only interested in the people of the crowds, but in the individuals that he encountered. And so often he would just invite himself into their homes, just as if he was inviting them into their lives, because that was exactly what he was doing. You know, when we come to the table at our house, we know that we have certain seats that we sit in, kind of like the pews at church. We know when we walk up to that kitchen table or that dining room table, someone sits there and someone sits here, and we know where our place is. It's ours. And what's also really interesting, that if we can't be at dinner one night, no one just takes our seat because we're missed. That's our spot. We're claimed as a member of a family. It's the same with Jesus. Encountering Jesus, he brings you to a table, to his table, and he invites you into the life of the church and to partake of this bread and juice because it's so much more than the symbols, the actual elements. You see, it's all about Jesus, just like our stewardship. He is the great sacrifice that allows us to have a relationship with him for all 